everybody, welcome to another edition of Super Soldier Talk. I'm James Rink. It is October something, I don't know, probably. <laughs> the 19th. The 19th. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Penny. So Penny is on the line with us, and I'm going to bring her in, in a, uh, a little bit. She's going to share her experiences about the secret spa- space program. I guess she probably has her own, a specific term for that. Um, but um, before we go into that, I've actually been sitting on this story for quite some time. I, I really, I've been waiting for the right moment to share this. And uh, somebody re, uh, recently contacted me about his experiences in the Deep Space Fleet, or DSF, and also Mars Defense Force. So what I wanted to do to tie all this in together is to give you a little bit background information about this. Now, if you've listened to the interview with Ilana uh, last month, um, which is on you know, our the Super Soldier Talk uh, archive, I, I've already shared this information, but I'm going to go ahead and share it again for the audience members who have not listened to that and also help give some background info. So basically, this is about the Secret Space Program. So um, one of the whistleblowers are, blow, one of the whistleblowers out there is Captain Randy Kramer, also known as Captain K, and he claims that he spent 17 years from 1987 and 2004 in an elite military unit that protected Martian citizens near Ares Primus, headquarters of the Mars Colony Corporation and the Mars Defense Force. His testimony suggests that NASA is lying that the atmosphere is 96% uh, CO2 with trace amounts of O2, which is 0.15%. So basically, it's unbreathable. According to NASA, the air on Mars is unbreathable. But evidently, that's not true. The air is very breathable, and it's similar to a warm day at an altitude of eight to 9,000 feet on planet Earth. And I, I, he doesn't say warm, <laughs> warm day could be what, in the middle of winter? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe summertime? I don't know. Uh, I guess it all kind of depends where you are on Mars and where you're on Earth, but eight to 9,000 feet, I'm assuming maybe in a, in a tropical region, with thriving animal and plant ecosystems. Maybe Penny can comment about that. Um, uh, go ahead. It's, it, it's the air levels of about eight to 9,000 feet, and it's 60 to 70 degrees in the daytime. At night, it gets incredibly cold. You don't want to be above. You don't want to be out of shelter at night. Okay, and that's probably makes it really difficult for the plant life. Um, but but we we can go um, explore a little bit more about that in just a bit. Let me continue on here. In the 1940s, the Nazis used secret space technology to colonize the moon and equatorial regions on Mars. But there was a huge electrical storms that wreaked havoc on their electronics, so they relocated to more northern and southern latitudes. Eventually, the Germans settled ancient lava tube systems, but they were not alone. There were fierce territorial battles between insectoid and reptilian races, and there probably, maybe there's some other races there too, I don't know. But going on here, in 1952, the Germans were prepared to release advanced technology for public consumption, but the U.S. government instead chose to go into business with them to keep the secret tech for themselves. And basically, if you recall the footage back in 1952 with UFOs buzzing the White House and over Washington D.C., uh, a lot of people said, "Well, why didn't you know why the ETs not show themselves?" Well, a lot of these ETs are just Nazis, and so essentially, the Nazis were putting pressure on the U.S. government, to say, "We have technological superiority. You may have industrial superiority, but we have technological, and we're going to tell the world that we exist. And the U.S. government, instead of wanting to admit the Nazis beat us technologically in the war, decided to go into business with them instead. And that's how this whole um, secret government began. And a merger took place between the shadow government and the Nazis, which grew into a massive military-industrial complex led by MJ-12, set up by Eisenhower in 1958. Um, I think, okay, so one other thing I want to mention is that Eisenhower recognized the growing threat, and he actually planted spies within this apparatus to bring about 
bring it under control someday. I don't know. Uh, maybe he thought he could try to guide it in a way that that would one day that this could be brought forth in a public in a public manner that would be beneficial to humanity. So, um, but going on here, around the mid 1970s, this group created the Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate, or ICC tasked with running Mars colonies and acquiring technology by any means. Nothing was left off the table that they were willing to trade. Around this time also appeared the Mars Defense Force and Mars Colony Corporation. To fund all this, an unofficial black project budget was set up which was reported to be $1.7 trillion per year between 1998 and 2000. I think uh, most recently the, that number has grown to $6 trillion U.S. dollars which totally, um, to, um, the, the U.S. defense budget is just, is just a tiny microcosm of what's, what's really going on out there. And I think that may be why a lot of people feel like they're suffering financially because so much money is being drained. However, some of these groups have become their own breakaway civilization. So they are financially independent of planet Earth, but, but some still need support. But um, anyway... Okay, so, um, all right, I think this might be a good place to go. Okay, so now I wanted to read the uh, testimony from the SuperTech DSF. And SuperTech DSF, uh, I'm, obviously I'm protecting his name. He did not want to come public, um, well, at least with with his own name. And um, so he's asked me to read this story to the audience and so um, this basically in my opinion it does correlate to a lot of what other whistleblowers are saying so let me continue on here and also Penny can probably confirm that that this actually mirrors a lot of her experiences as well when we get to talk to her in just a bit okay so going on here I am a super tech or at least I was one I was born with an IQ of 163 in the first week of third grade, our class was given a standard IQ test and the new achievement test, which of course was sent in, and then they sent it back. Then they sent back the score. Uh, he doesn't say when this was. This was about in the early 1960s, I think, is this, the timeline here. The IQ they said I had was 143, not 163, and that I scored average when I actually scored very high in my achievement test, especially in the embedded intuitive quotient. In other words, they knew I, who I was, and they knew I was an empath with a very high troubleshooting and mechanical aptitude, and evidently put some flags that I was selected by this deep space fleet for introduction into the fleet. And I think Penny can probably comment on how they were, when we get to her, to her how they um, selected her. Okay, but going on here. In other words, I'm a my lab. I've been reading about the definition of the word my lab or mill lab as it seems that it has become a catch-all for children that gets used for, ch uh, for children who are abducted to be used in a military function. I want to be clear something that after the initial some softening event, I was never purposely abused. I will not burden you with the details that I have shared with my psychologist, but I was raped by a man that was programmed to do so by them. I will explain who them are in a minute. Needless to say, this softening event, they successfully shredded my self-esteem. I think he said he was nine years old when this took place. It wasn't until my third wife that I finally met the woman that I was looking for, namely someone who had the knowledge and wisdom to see that I had been sexually abused as a child. This is a gift that I can never repay because it started me on the road to healing. On September 11, 2001, like everyone else, I was shocked by the destruction of the World Trade Center. After remembered in June 2003, 40 years later, the suppressed memories were engaged. My eyes were open to see that many truths I had missed. On September 11, 2008, I was watching a TV show about the 9-11 event. Something seemed so familiar about the collapse of the towers because not long before that, they were showing in the news the demolition that was being done in Las Vegas with the synchronized demolition with explosives of an old high-rise gambling casino. I said, my God, the World Trade Towers, they were demolished by explosives. 
With this realization, a veil was lifted from my eyes. The sense then, um, he says he's had uh, experience. I guess Corey Good helped up wake him up. I'm just going to skip over some of this stuff so because this is going okay. Um, okay, so he wasn't okay, and then he saw this show uh, Fringe and how FBI agent Olivia Dunham. As a child, was part of a secret drug trial which was trying to create super soldiers out of children by stimulating their natural abilities with drugs. That night after watching this, I was sitting on the side of my bed and I started to remember that I was taken as a child and used as a, in a secret space program as a maintenance technician on a deep space starship. I was not trained to be a super soldier. I was trained to be a super tech. By now you may think I might be some nutcase, but I assure you I am quite sane. I am an empath and I am someone that can fix anything. The official term is intuitive troubleshooter. Have you heard of that name, Penny? No. Okay. But Go ahead. my service my service I was I was speaking German, so they would have had another term. Okay. Um I don't think uh, Super Tech DSF mentioned what language he was speaking, but I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it was probably German cuz I think that's that isn't that where most of the most people speak what I mean what language most people speak uh, it's either English or German okay all right so going on here he said as Corey said in the interview Corey good that that is he was given about his mill lab experience um, have for a long time influenced the educational system in this country so much that they control the creation of standardized aptitude tests they give children is that how they uh, they found you, Penny, through um, no. tests? How, no, how did they find I, wa you? I was g genetically altered before I was born, so they've had me all along. Okay, and um, so obviously it, it depends on maybe what project you were all involved in, it. and of course they probably monitor your soul energy as well, past lives, and see who mm -hmm. you were. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, that, that's probably how they found me because I have past life memories of being someone they wanted. Okay. Okay. Well, this, this story is actually taking me a lot longer than I thought it would take. Um, so I'm going to have to just give you some quick, quick brief notes here. Uh, so he, he says he was taking a look. And this is all going to be on the website. I'll post a link to it and you can read the rest of it. But um, he says he was taken to Lunar, Lunar Operational Center, and he was prepared for induction into the Deep Space Training Academy. Does that does any of these names ring a bell to you, Penny? No. Okay. Um, he said they they reprogrammed on a device called a holographic examination table, or HET. Do you recall anything like that? I recall the examination tables. Yes. They programmed you to forget everything from the birth, from your birth to the day they get you. So everything. Um, I have no memories before I was taken, so that's that's consistent. Okay, right. Um, and I know in the other interview we, we recently did, you mentioned that when you were four years old. Um, they took you. Is that correct? Yeah, they took me this the summer before I started kindergarten, and um, they took me to Langley, and I was there for five years. So that would have been 1959 to 1964, and I was in a hospital unit there, and that's when they did the mind fracture. And that, and trained me to use the skills that I was genetically modified to have. Um, my particular training was they drowned me and revived me in the regeneration tank over and over and over and over until my mind fractured. And then I would be at a table and presented with photographs that 
I was to identify where the place was and what I saw there. Um, I was given photographs of people that I was to read their minds. Um, after a while, I was given coordinates without a photo and told to draw what I saw there. And if I did not perform to standards, I would be electrocuted and then dumped into the regeneration tank. Um, they also played a game with me that they call the daisy chain. And it's where they pluck the petals out. And if it, he loves me, he loves me not. And if it falls on, he loves me not. He, they shoot you dead and dump you in the regeneration tank and bring you back. And I lived with that for five years. During that time, I was taken several times to Montauk and trained in the chair. Um, the standard program that was at Montauk was all boys. But military laboratories had other programs that also borrowed the equipment. And I was in one of those. When you say equipment, so, do you, are you referring to people? Um, I'm talking more about the physical equipment there. But yeah, they, they refer, we were, as far as they were concerned, we were properties. Um, I had no more value to them than a lab rat would have to a biologist. Um, they might like me, but this was very early in the stages of mind control and there was no affection given to the kids. Um, I understand that by the 1980s they were gentler and found out the kids ended up more stable. Um, so, so they weren't uh, as abusive. They weren't as abusive later on, but at my stage of the game, they were all business and they didn't care how we turned out as long as we were usable. Do you recall people see, seeing people in cages? No, we were in hospital, we were in hospital room, rooms and they they were tiny rooms. They kept us isolated from each other. It was almost solitary confinement. Um, the only people you saw were the ones who actually dealt with you during the experiments. And they were very crisp and businesslike. There were occasionally people that would come in and clean the rooms and they obviously had instructions not to, not to interact with us. Um, once in a while, if they thought I'd been being good, or the other kids had been, we would be in a larger room in sort of a cafeteria setting and we'd be allowed to eat together. But we weren't supposed to talk. There was no interaction um, at all. Um, I half remember them making a comment about that the boys in the Montauk project tended to stick to time. Um, they would stay on the same timeline where the, the girls would skip dimensions and go other places with the same equipment. And so um, that was mentioned that we did go different places than the boys did. But, but the chair operated by your own psychic abilities. It, and so it was what was in you, not where they, they could program it to a vibration, but what you did with your own, with your own brain your own abilities would move it. Okay. Well, I want to mention that some people at Montauk claim that they have the use 
created the ability to cause them to shape shift from a boy to a female sex and they would use them in sexual rituals like that uh do you recall anything in that manner did they ever convert you I into mean, a boy and <clears throat> i know that that when i was a preteen that i wanted to be a boy it felt like i was in the wrong body but as far as what they did to me to create that feeling i don't know right it's probably better not to explore those memories otherwise your what um sanity you may have may, may um be fall apart more i've had some pretty bad flashbacks mm -hmm. so um do you recall waterboarding i recall i recall having my head dumped into a wash tub full of water it was much simpler than waterboarding they but i was on i was only four years old when they took me i was a toddler i mean these people were doing this to a small child and did you have any psychic abilities at that age that made you a target you think I think that I was genetically programmed. I've had regression hypnosis and I know that I was part of a program to produce humans that could survive the terraforming that's going on. And so they basically injected enough reptilian DNA that I basically have three parents, my, hum my two human parents and a third one that's reptilian, and I do not know what race. So I have a lot of abilities that are behind a wall. If I get really angry or really scared I can access them but under normal circumstances I can't um, things like frying electronics um, even at a distance um, I can do healing at a distance so I can probably kill without with that ability um, if you can heal you can usually kill with the same Telekinesis, Ability. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I can, I can't think of the term. It, it's the, the, I can't remember the name of the thing. Um, it's where you are sitting somewhere and you're giving coordinates and you can, you can go and see. Remote viewing, that's the word. Okay, um, I had a stroke in 1984 in real time, and so I have trouble remembering words. Um, so you'll find that I search for them. But I, I would remote view, and I can do, I can target through remote viewing. And I can... I'm not as good at remote viewing as some of the others were. And I got electrocuted a lot before they figured out I just wasn't as good at it. Um, so when, in 1964, I was taken to New York and taken through the jump gate there to Mars. And I went to a colony and because I went through the jump gate, I can't locate it on a map of Mars. But I was there for 10 years and went to school um, with, with the colonist kids. And the colonists were all Germans. And so I grew up speaking German. And um, at 19, 
I became a fighter pilot in the Valkyrian, which is a unit of women fighter pilots on Mars as part of Mars Defense Force. Um, I was officially U.S. Navy because I'm American, but I was on loan to Mars Defense Force. And for 15 years, my job was to locate clusters of the green reptilians on Mars and take them out. Um, the German colonists on Mars started the war because when they came, they used tactical nukes to clear areas to build their own colonies. And they didn't care what was already there. And, and when they went into the lava tubes, they used tactical nukes to clear a space for them as well. And so the other races on Mars have been fighting what they consider a defensive war ever since. Um, so the German colonists started this. But um, the green reptilians were already eating the native humans as their favorite food and started eating the colonists after that. Um, it got pretty nasty for a while. There have been some major, major battles where lots of humans were killed. Um, there were sandstorms that would build up so much static charge that the lightning strikes would hit Phobos. Um, if you were above ground, the storms were basically an EMP and would take out all your electronics, which is why most of the colonies are now underground, um, far enough to protect from the static. Um, there is an ecology. There are alpha dracs that are there, and the Germans are in alliance with them, um, which automatically made everybody else our enemies. There are the green reptilians. Um, they're about seven foot tall, and they're green. They have large heads. Some of them have tails. Some of them don't. Um, their claws are sharp enough that they can gut a human with one swipe. Um, they're highly intelligent. They just don't have the same level of technology that humans do. That's our advantage over them right now is that we have more tech than they do. Why do you think that's the case considering that we're, we're new to the space race? I'm sure they, they've been on Mars for a long time, longer than we have. Um, there's an underground race. They, Corey Good calls them a, a Garthans. They've called themselves all sorts of things through history. They've lied to humans on an ongoing basis. And so I'm not even sure that's what they're really called. Um, they sound to me like what the Sumerian tablets call the Igigi, which would be a, a Anunnaki human hybrid that went underground at the time of the flood. But um, they have a lot of technology that they gave the, the Tula Society. And the Germans are in alliance with the Alpha Drax, who also gave them technology. So they were given a lot of stuff between 1900 and 1930. And so that gave them a basically a hundred year jump on everybody else. 
and that's how they were able to get to Mars in the first place. From my understanding, they've been on Mars since the early 1950s, the Germans have. By the time I was sent there in 1964, they had they had a almost self-supporting colony on Mars, and that's with schools, and that's where I was. Um, they teach science a whole lot different than they do here, too. But um, so essentially, uh, the Nazis uh, moved to an article in '44, and then from there they started colonizing the Moon and Mars. So by 1963, yeah. and that's were well established. Um, and I also want to mention that, uh, according to, to Super Tech DSF, he said that um, when he was on the spaceships, he looked back on planet Earth, and she said how he said how beautiful it looked. But his, uh, I don't know, his commander said something the lines of, oh, that's, it's, not, it's not habitable. And it will be many years before plant life would come back because a cobalt bomb was used by the rebels to destroy the planet. And that's why they were, they were basically a group of pirates. And they were killing or attacking other extraterrestrial races to steal their technology uh, under the guise that, that all these aliens were evil because they destroyed planet Earth. Did you ha did, were you given a story like that? Did they tell you? Anything? I was told I was told Earth was uninhabitable, but that it was an ET attack, <laughs> not not rebels. And, and you believed um, it, right? Everybody believed it. Nobody doubted that. It it it's like if everybody believes it, you tend to go along with it. It's like. Why do so many people on Earth believe there's not a space program? Because everybody else goes along with it. Everybody else goes along with it. Um, it's part of the thing. If you don't think you have anywhere to go, you're going to do what you're told. If you don't have a place to escape to, it's like when you're on a spaceship. You do what you're told or you're put out the, the door into space. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Yes, that happens. <laughs> I was wondering, so, you mentioned that, okay, so some of these humans were killed. Now, if some of these people were on loan, um, I guess what, what, this is what the 20 and back or 30 and back program where they spend 20 or 30 years and age regress and sent back in time. So what happens if some of these individuals get killed when they're on, supposedly on loan? Well, if they can find their brain and it's intact enough to have memories, they can dump you in the regeneration tank and bring you back. Uh, how much of the brain do you think they would need to regenerate you? Uh, most of, most of the, the white matter. So it's the part on the outside. Um, it needs to be at least half of both hemispheres. And how, how and old could the flesh be before it's unusable or unrecoverable? Well, we were told if we found human brains to bring them back and let the te let the meds figure out. Yeah. Um, but I saw people come back after a week. So, um, hmm. yeah. I mean, theoretically, they could also time travel back in time and capture get the bodies and then right i mean they have time uh, they they can do lots of things <laughs> they can go back in time and pull you out if um i understand that's what they did with the battle of the blender um that was and was that they went back in time and pulled people out so that the reptilians didn't kill them. But um, they, they do a lot of things, and I wasn't privy to all of it. Um, I know that if you die while you're on a 20 and back, and they cannot recover you, say, for instance, the green reptilians ate you, and they couldn't get a 
get a lock on you to bring you back first. Then back when you were taken, you would just disappear and there would be no trace of you and people would be left wondering what happened. Um, that would be more like somebody was so obnoxious they got shoved out the airlock. <laughs> um, which they've done to people. Um, Have you ever done that to people? If I did, I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Okay, I, after I was 35, um, it was what, what would it be on real time? So this was after, when you were in the Val, Val, Valkyrie? Yes. Okay. I, w I was in the Valkyrie and, and, um. At the end of the term. Of that. At the third. end of the term, that would be, it would be about 1990 in real time. I was transferred to what Corey Good calls Dark Fleet. And I was a navigator on a transport ship. And I was a lieutenant which was the highest rank a non-German could have. Um, and the officers tended to be aggressive with each other and higher ranking officers would be really aggressive with lower ranking officers but there was this thing because I was female that I didn't get the chest bumps. I got a more emotional aggression. Um, I don't remember having a lover on the ship. And I was 59 when I was sent back. And that would be 2014 and at that point I do not recall anything of what some of the people now are referring to as a rebel alliance. There was nothing about that at all. At what do you all, mean rebel alliance? The well, Corey Good talks about there being an alliance fighting the Dark Fleet and fighting the Germans. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. So you're su suggesting that Corey Good might be giving out disinfo or his, his sources are maybe not intentionally. I don't think Corey would do that intentionally. I'm saying that I was there in 2014 and I, do, I had no knowledge of such a thing. Okay. Okay. Um, so oh, go ahead. That that's that's simple grounds. I have no knowledge of it. Um, if it was happening, it was not being spoken of in Dark Fleet. No. And you... as a, as a navigator, I would have been on bridge when it came through. Can you explain? Um, no, you mentioned earlier that the highest level, I guess, a, a U.S. I don't really call it, citizen, <laughs> was allowed to get within this apparatus was a lieutenant rank. Is that because the, the I'm assuming the Germans were the only one who could become the higher ranking officers. Is that correct? Um, the Germans ran everything what, that okay. I experienced and they maintained control by maintaining the higher ranks. Do you, do they ever show racism or any kind of prejudice considering that you weren't, what, maybe, I don't know, maybe you have German background, but do they show racism if uh, maybe they re recruited a black person or maybe they didn't recruit black people? I, I don't know. What, what, what's your thoughts on that? Did you ever see anything going on like that? There were, among the officers, there was a lot of racism. 
I don't remember ever seeing I don't remember ever seeing a dark skinned person as an officer. Even on Mars? Were there any dark skin? Even on Mars. There there were dark skin among the slaves. Oh. Okay. But but not in the officers. Mm -hmm. Now, my friend uh, recently remote viewed Adolf Hitler, and he said that he was on a spaceship, and he's wearing a general's uniform with a bunch of insignias, and he's about he looks about 30 years old. Do you think there could be some truth to that? They didn't let anybody get older than 35. There's a setting on the regeneration tank for age. And that's that's actually how they age regress you is they set it back to the age when you were kidnapped um, so if if the real Hitler is still alive and not a clone it's very possible okay uh, and do you think there is damage done to your DNA when you they do this age regression issue because I know Alana has said that she has a lot of autoimmunity issues and I think Penny you've also said that you mm -hmm. had some health issues as well what, what do you think is going on with that when they do the age regression and send you home there are DNA issues and um, because you're not being regenerated when you come home about 20 years after you come back you start getting sick and it gets worse and worse and worse over time and especially when you get to the age you were when you were sent back you suddenly have a lot of problems um, my doctor has actually said that he has no idea why I'm still alive much less functioning as well as I do because of the health issues um, he doesn't know about age regression sickness so he has labeled mine mixed connective tissue disorder and that's because the original diagnosis was systemic lupus and I wasn't dead in 2000 so they changed the diagnosis because what I was because it looks like systemic lupus so what and, you, go ahead and with mine I'm at the endocrine failure system endocrine system failure which if it were lupus I should be dead right now so because I've been in this stage since the 90s so what do you theorize is causing the age regression sickness what do you think what do you think is causing it I think the regeneration tank technology has flaws and that because when you're in service they do it to you regularly anytime you get injured any anytime you get sick anytime that that you start looking too old um, because they keep you at prime operating condition while you're in the service so you're in this tank at least once a week and when you get home you're not so when you get home you get all all the effects of all the times you were in it and the chemicals that were used on you because they when you're in the field you have all these chemicals that you take every day and it destroys your liver so when you when you're back at base you're in the tank to repair your liver otherwise you'll die and once you come home you're not in the tank once a week all right and after it I think it's a I think it's a flaw of the technology okay what I like to do is I want to read another paragraph here um, what super tech DSF described what he saw and you probably um, this actually correlates to what you're saying um, he said um, all the abductees or inductees were told to strip and we marched down a long cold hall to 
med. Um, I, okay, so I'm not quite sure what he's saying here. Okay, all of us were approximately eight years old, but varied in height. No one had weight problems or eyeglasses. We were re we received the shot in the arm with the air syringe, but God knows what was it that red substance substance in the vial attached to the gun. During my stay at the academy, I received a shot and body scan once a week every Sunday morning after ma mess. I guess it means mess hall. Upon mm -hmm. arriving at the academy, I was given a complete body scan on the HET, and I was given a baseline IQ test. They told me my baseline IQ score was 163, and when I graduated from the academy, it elevated 100 points to 263. One Sunday, I asked the nurse what was in the red vial. She didn't tell me, and she just smiled because there were cameras and mics everywhere even in the bathrooms and showers. After the weekly holographic scan, she whispered in my ear, ears as she helped me off the table. She said, it makes you smarter. This means that my IQ increased 10 points a year during the 10 years at the academy. In many ways, every point was needed because I remember doing differential calculus at the age of 10. So what do you, what do you think of that? Um, did, they, did they give you the red, the red vial? Drugs. I was in a different training system than he was. Um, uh, at Langley, I was injected with something every day, um, and I was in the I was in the regeneration tank at least at least a couple of times a week. When I was in Shola School in on Mars. I was treated like one of their kids. And then whenever I was a fighter pilot, it was basically the military style. But there, because I had been, I had been in the program so long, I was never sent to basic training like he describes. I know that when I was tested before my stroke, when I was in school, after coming back, I tested at a 153 IQ. After the stroke, I tested at 135. And I've recovered most of it. But I was, I, I did calculus it at 19. Um, I was really good at math. Um, do, you, uh, do you recall what your IQ what score was while you were on Mars? No. That I still don't have full memory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, well, okay, Courtney, let me read this. Actually, this this is, uh, by the way, HET I, is the holographic examination table. Um, yeah, yes, go ahead. You're going to say something? I do know that while I was on Mars, I was basically the same IQ as everyone there. So. Okay, this is what I want to read. Okay, so why, while he was on Mars, they introduced a false memory of being a product of genetic engineering. In other words, they told me that I was a test tube baby and had no parents. In this elaborate programming, I remember that when I was five years old, they told me that I was genetically bred to serve in the deep space fleet as a maintenance technician. So detailed was this memory implant that I remembered growing up in an orphanage with other test tube babies. When I was eight years, four months old, I was taken to the to Mars to the deep space training academy to start my training. Now, did they do any memory overlays with you like that? Um. I don't remember anything from my Earth life before I came back. So, oh, What's, this is Kazoo. Hello. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess, maybe they have something to <laughs> share. Maybe, maybe uh, your cat's been on Mars too with you. I don't. Yeah, my cat. cat. Ten, <laughs> my cat tends to be very supportive when she feels me anxious. Okay. All right. Um. Uh, um. I had, 
I have absolutely no memories from before they took me. Um, I know that my first Earth memory after coming back was telling my kindergarten teacher that Martians had left me on the doorstep and my Earth mother beating the holy crap out of me, screaming at me, I gave birth to you, you're mine. Um, talking about Martians leaving you on the doorstep in 1959 was not a popular thing. <laughs> yeah, I can it, imagine. <clears throat> so um, apparently the teacher contacted my mother and my mother was not happy. But this is my earliest Earth memory. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, but from that, I know that my mother gave birth to me. I did have a series of flashbacks in the night in the nineties around 1998 on Earth time that um, I had been a twin and that my twin had died before we were born. And that was the question I was asking about in regression hypnosis that I was told that I actually was genetically altered and that that my twin had died during the process and that my mother never knew there were twins. Wow. So, so um, but yeah, I know from the regression hypnosis, I actually was genetically engineered and that it was to, sur I was designed to survive the terraforming. Um, that there's an ET group terraforming the planet for their needs. They're making Earth warmer, drier, and more radioactive on purpose. What, the ETs and are doing that? The ETs are doing that. And that Eisenhower knew he did not have the technolog technological ability to stop them. So instead, they were designing humans to survive it. And I have no how, no idea how many well, are involved. Yeah, well, there, there are multiple parallel realities. And I, I think that that timeline pro probably does happen. Uh, John Teeter, uh, he claims that uh, about 40, 50 years in the future, the planet's 30 degrees warmer. And then... Um, 300 years in the future the, the planet's 200 degrees warmer so but 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 that that's uh, that's not the timeline that we're on I don't I don't think um we could I guess we could theoretically we could go into it but but that's going into quantum entanglement I, I want to stay on topic here so um now okay yeah so going back to the school so according to DSF uh, Super Tech, he said that, uh, Super Tech DSF, he said that when he was in the academy, he had the displeasure of accidentally um, getting into a conflict with a group of blondes. He said these men were the most arrogant, condescending human beings I ever, ever had the misfortune of meeting. It was like meeting three Biffs from Back to the Future. They were all bully square they were monsters lucky for me none of the upper class non-coms intervened one of the side effects of being super alpha alphas like blondes is they are so they are also megalomaniacs now the blondes were bred and trained to be political officers this type of command structure existed on russian communist nuclear submarines with behavior and every command of the captain being constantly monitored by the communist political officer um, so, um, I, so while you were in, in school, I suppose you saw a lot of that kind of activity, a lot of bullying going on. It's part of the German culture on Mars. You, you learn early to stand up for yourself. Um, 
you have to uh, it's an aggressive culture um, you have to stand up for yourself you have to be if if you don't stand up for yourself they'll torment you to death um, I've seen people just sit in corners and and go catatonic and have to be dumped in the region tank um, because the abuse was so horrible to, towards each other um, it's the way the culture is it's it's very they have a, a an attitude of they're surrounded by enemies and you have to be strong enough to survive and so where Americans would reach a point where that they would stop the bully the Germans don't they expect the kids to stop the bully and eventually you do but it takes a while to get there and the bullying is almost encouraged um, and I didn't have a parent figure to take up for me I was in some ways I was considered like an orphan it was like we were in um, I was in a boarding house sort of thing and I was nine when I got there and expected to take care of myself mostly I mean they would provide food and clothing but that was from a replicator machine it wasn't they weren't spending extra resources on me and nobody really nobody really cared if I was okay because I wasn't one of their kids um, they knew I had been damaged before I got in there that I had abilities that their kids didn't and they were jealous there were, it was more like how okay on earth I was raised in a redneck community so it's more like the weird kid on the block that their parents are are, are drunks and the kid gets may get into trouble but nobody takes up for them um, there would be times I would get angry and shut down the electronics in in the building there so I scared them there would be times I would get really angry and without even moving I would throw somebody across the room and so they soon learned to not mess with me um, and I have memories actually I should probably call them flashbacks of a battle that I have no context for it so I have no idea if it was while I was in school or while I was a pilot but I have mem flashbacks of the green reptilians battering down a wall and coming through and killing people and the flashbacks are so intense that I can smell the blood and I was so scared I built some sort of a barrier around me and the people I was with that protected us and I have no idea what this battle was does reptilian blood smell different than human blood um, a little bit 
they're more copper based than where we're more cool. iron based. And what about mantoids? Did you ever interface with them? Battle them? Um, I interacted with them, but I don't remember the context. Um, they are incredibly psychic, telepathic, and no barriers you put up will stop them. Um, they unless, could be, unless they shoot you up with DNA to shapeshift you into an insectoid, and then you interface with them. That's what Alana says she sometimes had to do. Um, I was in human form when I interacted with them. I think, I think it was more like my plane went down and I was captured. That's yeah. what it's feeling like. Mm -hmm. Because I was in human form. And um, I didn't even have to think they could. They were just reading me and I could hear their responses to, to things I hadn't even consciously thought. And um, I have the utmost respect for the mantids. Um, I understand that their biggest problem was the German arrogance in coming in and just picking a place and nuking it and then building their, their colony there. Um, there, about the time I left as a pilot, there was a peace treaty of some sort to stop some of the wars, but I understand that it's failed. I can imagine, but, considering the, the alpha mindset of these, uh, these blondes, they can't even get along with the, each, their, themselves or find the other aliens. Yeah, they, they do have they do have that embattled cultural mindset that they're going to be all destroyed if if they don't keep this warrior thing going. Hmm. Do you recall greenhouses where they were growing food or did they just replicate it? When I when I was first there they just replicated it. And the places where I was were underground. So if they had, they didn't really have greenhouses. They had more like um, hydroponic more lights. Like, yeah, more like I was thinking grow lights and, and the mental picture is the pot farmer in the attic. <laughs> Um, so why would they be growing food if they could replicate it? Taste, texture. Um, Can't beat the real thing, I guess. There's something about the real thing that just cannot be faked. So I guess and they didn't have any McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken on Mars. It's, uh, <laughs> I know what they Plenty of uh, what, um, German food, I suppose. Um, there were enough Americans that the replicators were set. You could have a hamburger or fried chicken. Or, um, I remember the French fries were really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was curious about something else because uh, you mentioned that um, you didn't have a mate while in this program and I, I talked to Alon about this what happens if you were to start you know messing around with other crewmates and she said that there is a, that they have a programming that that causes you to get a really bad headache um oh no I, I'm sorry she said that that was if you start thinking about planet earth thinking about returning to planet earth you get the headache I don't think she's but I think but, but she did say it was prohibited for crewmates to you know mess around a little bit. When I was a pot fighter pilot, I had three separate affairs with German colonists and all of them ended up killed by the reptilians. And 
I had no children while I was there. And I was... After the third one died, I gave up. Um, I figured this wasn't going to happen. And then when I was on a ship, they do have rules against shipboard romances. Um, and as an officer, I was not allowed to fraternize with the enlisted. And... Um, It just didn't happen. Right. Unless I have an altar that's a monarch that I don't know about. Yeah, you probably um, do if you've been at Montauk, most likely. It's a guaranteed. Um, okay. So. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, what were you transporting um, while you were working with this fleet? Not the Valkyrie. Uh, I don't know. What did you say? DSF? Okay. The DSF? Were you in? Is that? Or, or, why, why don't you Dark Fleet. Darkly. Dark okay. I don't remember the name of the ship I was on. Um, we were transporting a lot of raw materials. We were also transporting slaves and a product. Um, they they were cyborg soldiers, and they looked pretty much like Robocop. And they were made out of humans. Um, they were, they had to have a human consciousness to operate the technology that was given us by the Draconians. <clears throat> yeah, so this is one. This is one of the most horrible things out there is these cyborgs are created from people abducted from Earth. And they're, they're not volunteers. They're kidnapped um, with impunity. And there are millions of them. And they're being shipped out of the solar system. Now... Do you think they're they're abducting humans, taking their DNA, putting human back, and cloning that, and put, making a super soldier, or are they augmenting these humans and sending them off? I think they may be doing. I think they may be taking humans, cloning them, and using all of them to create these these cyborgs, and um. They're as much robot as they are human. Um, they're they're not. They have a lot of AI aspects to them, um, but they have to retain the human consciousness to operate the tech, and they are completely mind controlled. Um, but. I would guess that most of the people who have disappeared off of Earth are turned into these. Because the ones like me, they send you back. So this would be around 1990 is when you, you started witnessing this. Yes. So we know at least it was going on as early as then. Yes. Um... Do you think uh, so? So, what? Where were these cyborgs being sent off to? Do we know? Have we lost track of them? Or I guess does anyone care? Um, they're being converted in factories on Mars and in the asteroid belt, and probably through the whole solar system, because there are at least bases on every major moon in the solar system. But um, most of, some of them are being sold to governments on Earth. Um, most of them are being sold to ETs. Wow. And, yeah, they're being exchanged for technology.
So when you get stuck into one of these cyborg forms, you, you, there, you there's really no escape because you're totally AI programmed and you can't fight it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because JS6, he talked about this, how I was, I was like that in a past life. Um, I had the experience. I was like a commander, but um, I couldn't fight, fight the program. I had to do – I actually was sent off on missions to kill, exterminate people, and I didn't want to do it. But I had to do it anyway because I was totally controlled. Um, so I guess this has probably been going on for a very long time. Um, okay. Can, can you explain the difference between, between the dark fleet and the deep space fleet? Or is there a difference? If you're There's aware. not a difference. Okay. What about the ROM fleet? Are you familiar with that term? No. Tom, Thomas occasionally uses that term. Okay. Um, um, hmm? I don't have full memory from my Dark Fleet days. And something that a lot of us that I've talked to have in common is that the faces of the people that we interacted with are blank in our memories. It's like when they deprogrammed us and blocked that they went to a lot of effort to blank out faces. So we have trouble identifying the people we worked with. Uh, but do you recall ever seeing me? I recall seeing you, but I don't think it was while I was in the space program. I think it was since I came back. Um, hmm. Because I've been continued to... I, I have had ongoing abductions in my sleep. Um, I had years and years and years that I would dream the cover memory every Friday. So... I know I've been taken for missions, and I don't remember all of them. But yeah, I remember seeing you in your super soldier form. Uh, so does this mean that that this was a mission that took place recently, and that maybe you were participating with? Probably. And maybe you have a super soldier form yourself. Have you Probably. thought of that? I've I've been the last few months I've been thinking about lots of possibilities out there um, when I talked to Peter from ACIO he verified that all of my memories that I have are correct he was very reluctant to give me additional information um, and even seemed frightened by what was in my file so um what specifically did he say about your file that that scared him he didn't say what scared him but i told him i had been working on integrating my alters as they came up and he stuttered which is not usual for him and told me he did not think that was a good idea in my case. So um, he didn't give me any any depth to that. Did he say what your alters uh, were doing? Um, he talked about that one of them is, a, is an assassin for the CIA. And I know that since, since I became... Okay, I was one of the original founding admins for an SSP group on Facebook. And since I did that, I've been shot three times with directed energy weapons. And since I did my first interview with the Decoders of Truth group, one of my friends on Facebook was given a channeling through Voice of God Tech where a CIA handler or operative was telling me that I had outlived my usefulness and that I could be taken out at any time and basically what basically was telling me you know, we can kill you anytime we want. 
Well, you're, so, you're, you're all, they're all, it's almost like they're already killing you already, but they're not giving you any medical treatments for the, the trauma you went through. So I, I don't, I, it, it doesn't seem <laughs> like there's much difference. Um, Maybe you might be able to escape the pain. At least in, that's why yeah. I went forward in the first place was because they were shooting me. Um, my local hospital, I'm pretty sure, has my my file red flagged because if I go into the ER, the doctor's real friendly, then looks at my chart, and I can watch their eyes glaze over, and then they order a bunch of tests and push me off into the corner, and four to eight hours later, they come back, they say, oh, your tests were all fine, go home. Don't treat me for what I was in there for. Once I was in for adrenal insufficiency shock because I'm in endocrine shutdown, and another time I was in because I was peeing blood. And that time they gave me an antibiotic. But, you know, it's, I have to be dying, apparently, to get treatment. And I may not get treatment then. Okay, well, let's go in, going back here, because you mentioned that you might have done some work, or, or according to your file, the ACIO file, you did some work for the CIA. Do you recall missing periods of your life, uh, missing time, maybe, I guess, or, or maybe maybe they put cover memories, because if you were doing these missions, you think you maybe you had a week go missing here, a month go missing there, a year, what do you think? Um, I think these were things that I was taken from my bed and that it was like the twin like the 20 and back program except that I was doing the mission and then brought back to the time that I'd been taken. Um, my cover memory was a dream of being a mermaid in a kelp bed and I had that every Friday for literally years. So that's probably when I was being taken. I think it's also relevant to mention that According to Corey Good, he claims that he didn't want to go to school because they would pull him out of school and they would take him into a white van and take him to some base or something. But you said that they actually can just take you right out of your house. They don't need white vans anymore. Is that correct? That's correct. They, they just have, teleport you. They have portal technology. They can open a portal in your bedroom, pull you out, take you for as long as they want. And when you're when they're done with you, take you right back to the same time, because they record the vibration of that space and time when they take you, so they can just reset you to that time and bring you back. Okay. The world is literally frequency. Right. And what was the name of um, what do they actually call the school on Mars? Oh. <laughs> We called it Schule, which is German for school. It that that's what I went to was Schule, and regular they, school. And they did, were all the classes in German. Yes, I was being taught right along with the with the colonist kids, and they teach electric sun. They teach that Einstein made mistakes in his math, so. Relativity is irrelevant, and they teach uh, the they teach how things really work, and it's based more on ET science than Earth science. So it's very different than what we do here. There's even a whole nother layer of math that's based on base base sixty instead of base ten. Do they also go into uh, how the Jewish race was inferior or anything like that? On how the Jewish bankers destroyed the planet or? They really didn't. Nothing. No, okay. Um, when they got onto Mars, they forgot about Jews because there weren't any there. <laughs> Makes sense. They didn't bring them along. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, they taught it as part of Earth history, but Earth history was kind of 
irrelevant if Earth had been destroyed. Now, I have memories of being on the moon, and I recall seeing these the old-looking computers that they look like from the 1960s and the, the huge tape drives. And it doesn't make any sense for for a long, long time. I just didn't think this was – it just it didn't I, – I couldn't understand why because I'm not that old. Um, so so I'm – do you think they actually used – I mean did uh, – so – Back in the 1960s, would they still use that old clunky technology, or did they have something super modern even back then? Or when you saw tech like computers back then in the the, the 60s and early 70s, did they look very advanced? Do you recall that? What I recall on Mars was as modern as what we're using on Earth now, and that would have been. In the 1960s um, but the moon bases were set up first and these people are very conservative about changing out things you may have been seeing an archive hmm uh, okay well Be because they're anal retentive about archiving things that makes a lot of sense actually um, and do you have any memories of being on the moon? Or Lunar no. Operations Command, I think it's actually called. The technical no, term. I have no memories of being on the moon. I do have memories of being on a ship, on, the Mar on Mars and on a ship, and some place that's really fuzzy at, while I was being processed to be sent back. And it feels like a medical center. What do you think is going on Mars now? Um, I haven't had contact with Mars since 1990. So that what's going on there now um, the only information I have is from other whistleblowers okay I mean that's fair yeah I don't I don't know all right well let me continue reading a, a, a super text DF story here because this I think this is actually um, quite fascinating uh, he talks a little bit about his his abilities and why they chose him and um, He mentioned that in space based wars speed is everything and Neuron based computers complete billions more operations per second than silicon based computers uh, So I'm assuming they probably use quantum computing with uh, neurons. So that would make a uh, biological computers mm -hmm. After getting some experience and working on shuttles in a starship all silicon based technology I was assigned to a new state of the art starship was neuron based and that is when I met Mabel which is short for multiplexed algorithm algorithmic bioengineered logic does that name ring a bell to you penny um Mabel the neurology based computing system rings a bell Okay. Um, a lot. Of, I think the ships are actually biological base. At least some of them, the ET ships. Yeah. So some of the ET ships are biological based, and um, we did interact with those people. I was on one of the older cigar-shaped ships. So. And that was um, after you were in the Valkyrie, uh, 1994. Yeah. Okay. It was. Cigar. It was in Dark Fleet. I was. I was in an older cigar shape, and it was. It was a hundred person crew. Uh, how long was that, do you reckon? Football field. Okay. Uh, um, and are like the were the inside hallways really tight like a submarine is? Or was it spacious? Yeah, because um, ours were ours were pretty tight because we were um, we were a transport. Um, 
So we had to have more room for cargo. Did you have? And, oh, go ahead. And the slaves were, the slaves and the cyborgs were treated as cargo, not passengers, and they were not given the best accommodations. Did they ever uh, cry out asking you for help? Because I was a bridge officer, I didn't have a lot of interaction with them. Um, so I could pretend that it wasn't happening. But when I did interact, they did ask for help, some of them. Um, did they tell an address, uh, say, can you please contact my family on Earth? I would <clears throat> Most of them spoke English and... At that point, I had forgotten most of my English, so it was a language barrier, which was probably why they had me speaking German in the first place. Wow. But uh, occasionally, there would be one that would speak enough German to be able to ask for help, and they'd ask about Earth, and I'd tell them, Earth is dead. <laughs> I guess, all right, well, that's... That's, that's, what, that's what we believed. Yeah. Earth is dead. Okay. All right. So going on here, we, I'm going to continue on here. In 1963, when I was drafted into the deep, when I was drafted, the deep space scientists were working on a bio-based controls, and Mabel was a ma major breakthrough. In 1973, Mabel went online at the Mars Research Center, and Mabel became sentient March 10th, 1983. This was a major accomplishment in the field of science. It was felt that when and if Mabel went sentient that an empath could communicate with her without physical interface and they also believed that an empathic starship captain could receive complex sensor data and respond instantly. A team of empathic technicians were gathered at the Mars shipyards in June of 1986 when we all met Mabel. We were all highly experienced starship technicians from all over the fleet. And besides being intuitive troubleshooters, we all had the rank of chief. Before we got there, Mabel had been installed um, on the starship and had been communicating with, with by the head of engineering, Commander Gray, who I served, served under. Does that name ring a bell, Commander Gray? No. Uh, I served under my last ship. Commander Gray was one of the fine, fines office, finest officers I've ever worked with. In fact... He was like a father to me, and he introduced me to Mabel. The experience of talking telepathically to Mabel was amazing and was a highlight of my service in the DSF. One of the things that I am starting to remember is that the DSF was created to steal technology from other ET civilizations. To, yeah, to be absolutely yes. clear, the DSF was a fleet of techno-pirates. Instead, yeah. we were told that we were attacking the Rebel Alliance that poisoned the Earth atmosphere that we were at war with, the Rebels. And maybe, but if that's the case, then were, didn't you question where all these cyborgs were coming from? If you, if, the Earth, if you told Earth was destroyed, did you not think where are these slaves coming from? The mind control is so thick. You pretty much just... I knew there were colonies all over the whole solar system. And we were told that Earth was dead. So we all knew there was cloning technology. And the culture was... Germans were better than everybody else, and white people came next, and other races were scum, and many, many, many of the slaves were other races, and it was, <sighs> the me now cringes at the whole, th the whole thing. And I've had a lot of issues dealing with the guilt of my participation. Well, how, how, does, is your family supportive of you? 
My family doesn't know about any of this. I've tried talking to my youngest child who is 32 and he doesn't want to know. Do you think um, he was used as well? It's possible. Um, I know that after coming back I was part of an ET breeding program and I may very, my kids because I was genetically modified to survive the terraforming, my kids are probably part of it too. Um, they have a genetic disease that has not appeared in our family before. Um, so it's reasonable to expect that it came from military labs. Um, or from me being in the tank so many times. Uh, hmm. Do you think the U.S. government or the secret, the cabal here on planet Earth got some special, I mean, the technology in exchange for these cyborgs, these kidnapped people converted into cyborgs? When you're dealing with ETs, there's no money involved. It's, it's barter. And if that's what they were looking for, the ETs would would give what the Germans were looking for. And the Germans were looking for tech. Hmm. You would think these extraterrestrials would have a higher level of uh, humanity, I suppose, <laughs> a respect for humanity more so than the Germans did. But I guess maybe maybe they just don't care either about life. If you're a 3D physical being, then you're at a certain spiritual level. That's what I've gathered. Um, that they may have more tech, but they're not any more spiritual than humans are. Yeah. In my opinion, the ETs all have an agenda of their own. And a lot of them, their agenda regarding humans is we apparently have something unique in our DNA that they want. And a lot of, let's be honest, a lot of them consider us food. Um, a lot of them are looking f to improve their own DNA with what that unique thing that we have. Um, there are an amazing number of them that think we have destroyed Earth and they want to take it from us. And to be honest, I don't trust any of them. And you think um, one day when all this stuff starts coming out, mainstream public, I mean, it's already coming out, uh, do you think an effort will be made to, say, Find, find these kidnapped people, these slaves, to free them. And I'm sure probably some of these slaves are on Mars too because it sounds like the, the Germans were keeping slaves as well. Um, the military uses, Mars Defense Force uses a lot of slaves. They're considered disposable and they're sent on the higher risk missions. And maybe, maybe they make clones and use them as slaves. You think that's the case as well? Well, that's what they tell the Germans they're doing. I mean, that's yeah. what they tell the Martians, Martian humans, that those are all clones, that that's why they're disposable. So we probably we probably need to initiate some kind of legislation or laws, to human rights, even for clones as well. That's going to, I mean, that's something that will, needs to be considered, um, obviously, right now. I think, I think with the state of the tech, even on Earth, even in main earth people need to understand that clones are still human beings and while you may think they don't have a soul what if they do do you think some uh, clones have souls i don't know why they wouldn't yeah. i mean they have human dna peter says they they clones have souls 
Even that's my feeling about them is that clones have souls. Um, they may not be the same soul as the original human, but that's my feeling on it. And I think they should have human rights. Okay. Otherwise, otherwise, what are we doing here? Um, and we end up with a, a tiered structure where people are substandard just because of the, the incidence of their birth. Uh, on a, on an ethical on an ethical point, I think the clones deserve human rights. Mm. There's no difference genetically between them and us. Uh. Um, and um, there was something else I was going. To, I lost the train of thought. I'm sorry. Yeah, we were talking about clones on Mars, and uh, but anyhow. Well, oh, about this this whole slave situation you were asking about if we could trace them the Germans are anal retentive about records they probably know exactly where everyone is by getting that information out of them and being able to retrieve the humans from ETs especially if they've been dinner is going to be another issue entirely yeah, well, this is all going to have to get sorted out once the disclosure is made. I think that's, um, I'll let the politicians figure that one out. Um, I don't trust the politicians any more than the ETs. Well, well uh, who, 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 who do you think <laughs> could solve this issue then? Um, I think what we need to do is, is disclose it to everybody, form ethics tribunals, and... The problem with the Nuremberg tri tribunals was that they didn't go after the Americans and the British and the French as well. And I think what we need to do is take all of the elite of all of the countries on Earth and all of the colonies in the solar system and put them through war crimes trials. Um, crimes against humanity. Um, the details are of their crimes are pouring forth. If you look on the internet, there are 10 million documents on WikiLeaks alone that most of them are documenting crimes of the elite. They refer to humanity as useless eaters. In many cases that's what a lot of them think of us but are we if we were such useless eaters why would the ETs want our DNA so badly we're yeah. more than we think we are all right well let me uh, finish this last part for you um, to conclude this because um, we've been talking for a while, and um, so all right. So this basically explains how this ended for, or how DSF was sent back to planet Earth. He said that when he was 38, he was told that he needed to go to Mars for a refresher course at the academy. Upon arriving there, I was ordered to a medical lab, and was, and as I walked into medical, I was met by a six foot four inch tall blonde named Doctor Gabriel. He told me to close the door and to lock it. After walking over to his console, pushing an icon, he told me to have a seat. He introduced himself and told me that he activated a false video recording in the severance, into the severance for medical so that we can talk in private. He started to explain that I was not a test tube baby, but that I was selected through the achievement test I took on Earth in the third grade. I told him, isn't Earth dead? He then started to tell me the truth about Earth, myself, and why I was drafted. Evidently, in 1963, they were not able to produce a test tube baby that grew up without becoming psychotic. So they started the drafting program because 
they are very good at holographic age regression technology, which I guess they're not so good, um, Penny, because <laughs> they haven't got it all fixed. <laughs> and mental pro programming of normal, naturally conceived people. He admitted that he was the inventor of the HET, which is what is the holographic. <laughs> Make sure I get this here right here. Ho what, what did I say? It was the holographic something? Do you remember? The table. Yeah, that. Ta okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, the table. Um, and the application of the HET program to to program minds to perform the holographic age regression procedure. I asked him why he was telling me all this. He said that not all blondes are evil. Or maybe all Nazis. Okay, not all <laughs> are evil. And then some. By the way, do they do they wear Nazi swastikas on their uniforms, or is that was that not? no? Okay, so they don't really refer themselves they, as Nazis. They do. They do wear the Iron Cross, which was German before the Nazis. Okay, so they don't really resonate with the Nazi kind of philosophy, but more. Maybe... They're more German, German, Teutonic. Okay. All right. They still have some of the Nazi philosophies, but they're more Teutonic. Well, did you ever see any swastikas anywhere in any of the facilities or uniforms? Yes. Okay. Um, in the facilities, not so much on the uniforms. All right. He also said that he regretted using the HET program. Um, I'm sorry, the HET to program lies into the minds of children in order to control them. Then his face was filled with great regret, and he said, I'm also sorry that I'm going to have to send you back to, into the situation we have placed you in 30 years ago before you were abducted, and I want you to know that is not your fault. I said, not understanding a thing he was talking about, okay. <laughs> his face then went back to the original stern expression that, I greeted, that greeted me and pushed a button on his console, and I was rendered unconscious. After being in a coma on the HET for three weeks and regressed back to eight years old, and, I, and Corey Good has also said this, that you have to be very still for at least two weeks mm -hmm. um, for them to age regress you. Um, he didn't really explain too much. Do you have any, do you understand why that's the case? That's or, because they use uh, a, they take your DNA and form a hologram based on the age that you are supposed to go to and your cells conform to the hologram and it's, you have to you have to stay still for it to do it otherwise the cells won't conform to it but they had a really big job with me because I was 59 and they had to take me back to four. So how many weeks did you have to stay still? I, I don't remember. It's a blur. I'm sure I was knocked out from Oh, I hope all so. That, that would have been that would have been very scary to stay still for more than three weeks. That's yeah. probably what they had to do for you. Because it took him three weeks to regress from 38 to eight. So it probably took you maybe six weeks. Or more, Probably seven weeks. Um, I was transported back in time, thirty years to Earth, teleported in in my original eight-year-old body back onto the toilet seat where they had taken me seconds before. Doctor Gable, Gable or Gabriel, Gabriel programmed me to forget the last thirty years of this experience, but to consciously remember the birth, my birth till that day, but not consciously remember the rape that he just had before they took him. He also interconnected remembering the rape and any memories of the past 30 years with an intense feeling of guilt. What they did to me was absolutely insidious. These evil men took away my childhood innocence and my opportunity to become a doctor of physics and change the world. Is that how you feel that, that, that they st stole the best of your, your life and just made everything a mess for you now? No, I'm more angry that when in this part of my life I went to college, um, I had a full scholarship at 17 to go to Cornell and my redneck father turned it down 
And so I went to junior college and then went to San Diego State. And that was when my age regression sickness hit. And I was going to be a physician, a medical doctor to help children with endocrine disorders. And because of the age regression hitting, I was unable to do that. So that has, <clears throat> that's what I'm angry about, is the age regression kept me from doing what I felt my mission was, which was to take, to be a doctor for sick kids. And um, also that my children have this genetic disease that's the hereditary form of Addison's and it's because of them messing with my DNA and then theirs and so their lives have been affected by it whether or not they were also taken to the secret space program which I don't know and the constant abductions the nightmares, the flashbacks. Um, I don't so much resent the time on Mars or even being able to be in space. That, what bothers me is that I have these abilities that have actually been blocked where the at 61, I'm a disabled granny on, on Social Security. It almost seems like a fund needs to be set aside for the victims that have been through these projects to, to give them a pension fund or something just to help them out, um, considering all the work that they've done for, it appears, I mean, the U.S. Navy, I mean, so working as liaison for the, uh, the Germans, um, you think we should we should be compensated but I guess um, well, I I was abducted at least fifty five years, yeah, and never paid. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that you you've most of your life you felt like you never could get ahead. You've always been pushed back. Yeah, I've been shoved back, shoved down, and and every time that that I had an opportunity, it was blocked, and. It's been an entire lifetime of that, and I truly believe they're behind it. Okay. All right, so the last um, part I'm going to read here is um, responding to Supertext DSF about his age regression. He said um, he feels a lot of anxiety uh, by talking about this, but... Um, the question is, is why mm -hmm. why did they rape him before taking him? Because they shredded, so he thinks it's because they shredded his self-esteem so they could keep him from becoming anyone of significance. With the use of AI technology, they, they are, I guess maybe that's Mabel, um, they are able to predict the life path of a person will take. Knowing this, they program a, a poor, unsuspecting man to rape him, or who knows, he probably project too. My belief is that if they had not raped me and taken me and given me bad knees and bad eyes in my life, I would have been very different. I also believe they did not like the effect I would have had on the timeline they wanted, so they modified me to prevent me from developing my full abilities and take the world down a different timeline than they wanted. I don't care if anyone believes a word I say, because like many of us my lab, mill lab children, such as Corey Good and I, we have no physical evidence except through regression therapy. These memories are as clear to me as when I went to professional Major League Baseball Park for the first time with my dad. I can remember the smell of the popcorn, hot dogs, and freshly cut manicured field. It is important that you understand all these things did happen to me as they did to thousands of other Mill Lab children. Super Tech DSF. Um, they have a separate program that operates through tech similar to Montauk. They have a window that they can read the future through. They can even, 
they can go forward or backwards and they can videotape it and so they can identify who is going to be prominent and who is going to make a difference and then go back in time and preempt that person and those are people they're they're abducting it's it's serving them two purposes at once it's stopping you from doing what you would naturally do and they're using those abilities for what they want yeah so like you could have become a, a, a really a, a, maybe a world famous doctor made a lot of help yeah instead I guess the uh, the Germans got a hold of you and instead okay uh so well that's all the questions i have is there anything else you would like to share to the audience that we didn't go, go over that you feel is important to share at this time um there are a lot of us out there um some of us have been starting to wake up We're not all people who hang on Corey's every word. Um, I have not been contacted by Blue Avians. These are memories that I have. Um, I stopped listening to videos of the other whistleblowers when I realized that I had memories of my own to stop contaminating things. I had listened to enough of them that I know what terms they're using and if I don't remember the right name then I will use their terms so that people know what I'm talking about. But I was really there. Makes sense. And eight, that's been confirmed through the ACI, ACIO database. And uh, do you have a book or a website uh, to share? Where... Mm, not at this time. Okay. Um, I'm. Or a movie deal? <laughs> I, no, I basically just came forward because I was being shot. And I hadn't thought that far ahead of things yet. Okay. Oh, this is my partner walking behind me. Hello. Uh, so all right well yes he's been very supportive wonderful i'm glad to hear that so wonderful okay um well in that case uh thank you for joining us penny and listeners uh, if you have any questions for penny please leave them in the comment section and please be appropriate penny's been through a lot of trauma i know there's a lot of trolls lately and i'm too busy to monitor the the, the uh, comment section so i ask that you please be polite and respectful also, um, visit SuperSoldierTalk.com to find more information. Uh, the story, the, the full story for SuperTech DSF will be posted there. And also, please visit our sponsor, NeologicalTech.com. They help sponsor the show so I can make this happen. Also, um, subscribe to the channel uh, where uh, we can find more updates like this, as well as the interviews with Peter, and maybe get your own file when that's opened up to the public. And... Um, once again, um, thank you, Penny, and thanks, thank you, listeners, for listening in. And until next time, bye-bye. Please consider supporting Super Soldier Talk by purchasing your own Neo Meditation device. Your Neo Meditation device will help you reduce stress integrate trauma, enhance intuition, enhance clairvoyance, and enhance creativity. Get yours now at www.neologicaltech.com.